Welcome back to SuperCloud 3. I'm Chuck Roy, Dave Vellante, kicking off day one of two days of coverage. Security plus AI is the topic, and we're here with Doug Merritt, formerly the CEO of Splunk, coming out of retirement. He retired now the CEO of Aviatrix, uh, CUBE alumni, friend of the CUBE. Doug, thanks for keynoting and kicking off SuperCloud 3. I'm honored to be here, really. Thank you for bringing me back. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it wouldn't be long um, <laughs> for you to be back in the game. Took some time off, congratulations on taking that time off. And now the CEO of Aviatrix, Steve Mullaney. We've been covering Aviatrix you know, pre-COVID, they had an event. They, they were the first ones really talking multi-cloud before that became kind of a thing. Yep. They saw the software side of it. We know Steve, you're taking the helm, take it to the growth. What's the, What's the attraction? What what made you pull come out of retirement? Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. I, I I honestly thought one, I didn't have any idea how exhausted I was after the eight year run at Splunk. So it was fascinating. My wife, like two months in, commented, "How many days are you gonna sleep for nine hours?" <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah, I guess I was I was running pretty hard there for a while. Um, and I thought I I had been affiliated with a couple of great VCs. I was doing a bunch of sidecar investing. I sat on stepped on a couple boards doing advising, I thought that could be really a great way to stay in the game and give back, but not be on that hot seat of, yeah, when you are an operator of any sort, any leader, and definitely the CEO, like you are on 24 by seven. And it's hard to sleep at night sometimes because there are things going on that you're worried about. And all my VC friends and other people that had kind of chosen this dabbling side, which is more me than a VC, it's like, you know, the best part is I can sleep at night. It's the operator's problem. I, yeah. I hand it to them and they lose sleep and I just wake up <laughs> in the morning and figure out what to do next. Um, and that was a nice artifact. But what I found over a year and a quarter is when you do that, um, even within the venture capital community, you're more or less an individual player. Right? You're individual partners, there are people that come together, but your daily activities are kind of, you are trying to govern your uh, time and, and there isn't that vision, mission, purpose, and constant team. Um, and there's not that really deep customer contact, there's not super deep product contact. You get in and do the best you can as a board member or when you're making an investment or advisor, but it's not the same as um, I am, I'm not the chick chicken in the breakfast, I'm not just laying the eggs and the pig. Like I'm <laughs> yeah. committed to this breakfast. Um, and that, what I found nine, 10, 11 months in is, was, I, I love my family. I, I'm one of those guys that actually likes and loves my wife and love to spend time with her and my kids. But yeah. I just, I really missed being yeah. on the field and being part of a team sport. And you got a great um, run there at Splunk, obviously went public and all the great success, data, now security and multi-cloud, Aviatrix, growing company, so it's, Somewhat pressure cooker, but not too, you know, you're going to ride that, grow that. So it's early pretty much for the company. Yeah, being a private company is great. That was one of my criteria is it'd be nice to start private and see if we can take take the company public. Um, but a, a lot of, so when I decided, okay, let, I, it, I should jump back in. Like I, I miss being part of the team. Then the criteria of what kind of team are you going to join becomes really important. Um, and Steve and I have known each other for, I don't know, probably 10, 15 years. Um, he was, he spent a lot of time in Los Gatos. That's where I lived before moving to Austin a few years ago. Um, and watching his career journey, especially when it comes to networking, uh, he's been uh, uh, really, really good at picking up trends way before they become uh, successful, including Nicera, and obviously that really successful acquisition with VMware. Um, so knowing the team and understanding the category that they're going after is certain, certainly important. Um, I've learned that, that being really close to the board and having a great relationship with the board is super important as well. And two of the board members at Aviatrix um, were early board members of Splunk. And I'd spent time with them before becoming CEO and then post-CEO in that role. So um, my my outside in, uh, Steve had raised his hand and said, okay, I'm, I'm the zero to 100 million guy, um, and this is now getting, getting close to 100 million, and maybe it's time for somebody else. Yeah. Um, and they crafted a list, and according to Steve and the board members, <laughs> I was top of the list. It was <laughs> apparently <laughs> shortly after my, uh, my, my uh, the jump from Splunk. Um, and so when they approached a few months ago, it, and I dove in, mm. this has a lot of those characteristics of Splunk. Um, it's a, a little bit early on the trend, multi-cloud networking, you know, obviously a super cloud event. It's incredibly important, I think, for every business out there. The last data I saw, 83% of major organizations have got a multi-cloud strategy. They, they want to be multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. But the reality for most of us is you started in a cloud. 
and you're porting a lot of last generation workloads that really aren't cloud native to that cloud that you were in. And maybe through acquisitions or experimentation, you're a couple of clouds, but you don't really have a mesh across the clouds where you've got uh, workloads seamlessly traversing, not just multi-clouds, but now we've got Intelligent Edge and, um, and, and Aviatrix saw this back 2014, 15, and 16, um, and has made those investments to actually be there. I think it was ahead of the, the, the game here. I remember in 2021, we were up on the stage at AWS reInvent, and one of your investors, your early investors, was sitting down there, and uh, Mulaney and, and I were up on stage, I don't know if you were there, and, and the investor said, it's happening, and Mulaney said, it's happening. We said, what's happening? And, and we had coined this term super cloud, and that's what's happening, but to your point, Doug, it's not like somebody wakes up and says, oh, I got to buy a super cloud. It's not a, a product, right. right? It's an architecture, it's a sort of maybe a philosophy. And so now you got to get into solutions that actually solve problems, which is I presume where you're spending a lot of your time and thought. Yeah, that the, what it, one of the characteristics of Splunk I loved is I called it a blue collar culture that back when they created the index and tried to optimize logs, no one even thought the logs were worth that much. Um, and, it, and to really get to petabyte scale with that data, it's just a lot of hard roll up your sleeve and do plumbing, non-glorious plumbing work because these things have to work. And networking is that same way. Like it is a very difficult category to do well. You're at ring zero. If the network goes down, all this great stuff we talk about, yeah. seamless applications, real-time customer communication, employee empowerment, it just goes away. Like you, you cannot operate your business. So very hard to do. You have to roll up your sleeves and really understand the domain um, and be super diligent in doing it effectively. Um, and when I look at this multi-cloud piece, like we would love to have the ability, the, the clouds continue to do a good job of differentiate them, differentiating themselves on what kind of workloads are they optimized for. And all of them want to say, hey, we can do anything, yeah. but it's hard. You've got to make investments from networking in Silicon all the way up to optimize different workloads. And if we, if this pattern looks like any of the past thousands of patterns in tech, yeah. there will be, you have to, uh, to, to be effective, to effectively address the needs of your organization, you're going to wisely choose to develop different apps and different workloads uh, where they'll operate best, which will likely be different clouds. So, yeah. one of the things we were talking about, SuperCloud, I'd love to get your thoughts because, yeah, being at Splunk, you had, the, you saw the data evolution and revolution there it continues. That's the constant theme in our SuperCloud narrative is data in all aspects, this is security plus AI for this topic in SuperCloud 3, but network plays a big role in, in security. Data and networking are the two kind of areas you see a lot of action around security, whether it's built in as a platform or a tool or tracking packets. Um, so networking across multiple environments is a huge deal. That's what you guys do with Aviatrix. What's the role of data in this too? Because you can bring that data perspective. Love to get your thoughts and reaction to data and security and, and networking. Yeah, I, I think data, as you guys have talked about and, and we're all witnessing, is the, the fuel for what's really going to make um, effective AI work. Like you need enough elements to train these different algorithms and to start to get more proactive and, re and intelligent approaches to what should be doing whatever domain that you're in. Um, for us in networking, the data that we care a lot about is what's happening with the network. How do we make the network more resilient? How do we make it more secure? How do we optimize traffic flows? Um, and again, if you look at these multi-cloud environments, if you look at the network services from any cloud provider, they're still relatively immature and you know, they'll continue to progress them. Our job is to stay ahead of those within each one of those clouds. Um, but when you go multi-cloud, it gets really difficult. So trying to provide that intelligence, that resiliency, that um, adaptability, the high security across these clouds is, is a difficult challenge. Um, in addition, you know, trying to protect the data sources that live at, at so when I look at tech, it's all about layers. I, mm -hmm. It's hard for the networking vendors to jump up to be data plane providers. We've got a data plane to transmit networking da data across the network, but yeah, you know, when you look at Snowflake or Splunk or uh, Databricks, they've got more of a data plane. How do I curate mm -hmm. data that's, that people are going to take advantage of in whatever use case? Applications plane is very different. Um, compute, the compute layer is different. So sticking within that layer is where people tend to really get lots of momentum. Um, and enabling that network to ensure that at least for the network traffic, you've got understanding of what is beginning to, who is touching your data, what, uh, were they potentially taking that data? Mm -hmm. um, we do have 
deep packet inspection capabilities. So there's some interesting things that we can actually infer mm -hmm. from that networking layer that stops at a certain layer, right? You need to partner with the data players, you need to partner with the uh, different uh, application vendors to bring, so you can bring a whole picture on what's happening with the capabilities and also the security posture across the system. So you've got this cross cloud comp complexity. So thinking about AI, what were you doing with AI before uh, specifically and how, how has that changed? Has that changed your thinking with you know, the AI heard around the world? Yeah, it's um, the large language model uh, Lemming March. <laughs> like, like if, if you are a company today and you're not claiming to do something with LLMs, you're just in trouble because obviously everybody is. Um, but they do have a specific purpose, right? And 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 we're still wrestling through what those what that purpose is as a as a as a world and how do you contain that purpose and keep humans safe and there's like everything else, barbells on joy and fear simultaneously. Um, within Aviatrix, uh, we're lucky enough to have an incredible development team. Um, people that were in the MIT Media Lab back in the 80s and 90s when AI was the first burst where it's supposed to take over the world and we're dealing with whole different um, vectors and, and algos and artifacts back then um, through Google engineers, Facebook engineers, Yahoo engineers, so really adapt with networking, really understand data, um, and then different machine learning and, and AI capabilities you can bring to networking. Um, and it's, I, I think like every other domain, LLMs will have a play in networking. Um, when you're trying to think about uh, understanding attack surfaces, that things that are more language oriented or can be translated to language, um, how do you optimize palace, uh, policies across these very complex networks and be more proactive and resilient? Um, those types of things, I think LLMs, we're, we're playing with everything that we can think of right now um, to see where across the different use cases we can, what, what types of AI we bring and where they're going to add the most value. Um, but right now, yeah. going back to how early we are in this multi-cloud world, just getting secure and resilient transport between clouds mm -hmm. in a seamless basis is, I mean, that most companies really, really wrestle with that. It's, if you've got an app that spans two clouds and ensuring that that app performs the way that it should and is secure the way that it should and you understand traffic routing, it's, it's a non-trivial task and you don't need an LLM to, to do that work. Um, you need an effective data plane, a control plane, and uh, a way to both observe what's happening and invoke policy anywhere that that traffic flows across different clouds, across different edge providers, back to your uh, proprietary you know, old data centers, like data, data and networking is flowing. Yeah. So there's some AI in there, it's just not generative AI necessarily. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, yes, they're, they're, I, I think the world is still wrestling with or, or, or visualizing uh, how do I use LLMs. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as you guys know, the yeah. choice of which <laughs> LLM models to, begin to use is off the charts and the open source exploding world is, it's moving so quickly. Um, it's it's your graph, it, I mean, it's just, uh, it's unbelievable. It's, it's interesting, you know, on the latency side, physics, obviously networking physics is everything, latency is key. When we talk to um, infrastructure folks, they're skeptics when it comes to AI, well, oh, it's, it's BS. But they, when they see configuration stuff that's yes. mundane, no brain, that's automation, then it's not so much AI, but they see it playing there. But one area they do see hope and pros pros prospects is observability data. Mountains of data around telemetry. Um, you've been in that market, that's changing and growing. More and more data points coming in, Absolutely. whether it's network logs or network traffic patterns or application telemetry. Yep. I mean, everyone's hoarding data right now. I mean, yep. no one knows what to do yet, but how do you see that observability piece coming in? And that, and I mean, the interesting part is every layer of the tech stack has got observability. So there's a whole observability framework within Aviatrix, um, which is who our co-pilot um, offering. That's different than the way that Datadog would talk about observability. Like we we use Datadog observability capability for our development team and for the applications that we roll out. Um, so we all have the opportunity to do a better job of. Uh, parsing through mountains of data to try and find the patterns that are existing with the way that our systems are behaving, whether we want them to and don't want them to. Um, and L again, LLMs I think could do a, a really effective job given a constrained data mm -hmm. set and the right training and the right guardrails around it to um, both 
observe those patterns, but then to begin to iterate on the appropriate ways okay. to tune and optimize what you're doing. And it's when I see where I think a lot of efficiency will be injected and cost structures might become significantly more advantageous to customers is the human component on that. Like what data do I grab yeah. and what metric do I create and how do these metrics tie together and what alert do I then generate from that? That is, it's a very expensive human component. I need really thoughtful, talented folks and they need to curate that entire data pipeline and what to do with that data. Um, I think LLMs can, like they are with, with basic coding right now and basic uh, SEO uh, <laughs> material, I think it can really impact the speed, efficiency, and quality of that. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those areas that we're looking at. So not so much necessarily taking action, but allowing humans to have you know, curated data so that they can take the action. Yep, and then eventually probably Taking action. some action too. <laughs> but right now it's a little dangerous. Yeah, I'd be nervous right now. I'm going to do this. You yeah. want me to do this? I right. like some checks and balances. <laughs> like, well, well, Doug, not, great. Not going to bring down an app. Great to now. have you on here. Wait, wait, I got one question okay. before you break. Our editorial team leading up to SuperCloud 3 has been asking this question of a, a number of folks. And when I first heard it, I said, eh, it's kind of, but it's really an interesting question, the answers that we've been getting. So will AI ultimately be more beneficial to attackers or defenders? What would be your answer? Um, I think if we follow human behavior, I think the attackers are going to arm themselves more aggressively first. And I think it will propel the defenders to really, really up their game more quickly. And then I pray that it becomes more powerful to defenders over time. Um, but it, we're, we're in another just crazy arms race, I think. Um, that just got compressed. It's, oh my gosh, yeah. it's the, the power is, it, it's, it's insane for the good and bad. Yeah. Well, it's been great to see. I want to ask you one final question about Aviatrix, obviously coming out. You got you mentioned you want to have a vision and be part of a team, private company, so it's a little bit, you know, not as pressure packed. What is your vision for Aviatrix as you lead that team and grow that, take it to the next level? Okay, Steve took it to the 100 million mark, you're going to take it to public. That's the vision, but your vision of North Star, what's the Aviatrix uh, thinking? How do you see this playing out? So everything that you guys are evangelizing with SuperCloud and so many of your other um, podcasts and, and, and broadcasts go back to the power of how do you connect people and try to do that in a transparent and audible way so that we can get all those amazing benefits from technology and, and LLMs are no exception. Like without connecting everything together to get that visibility, there is no benefit of generative AI or there is no way to, to actually roll out generative AI. Um, what I view Aviatrix as, as being behind is we're all about connections everywhere that are transparent and resilient and secure. Um, and I think without a cloud native architected solution uh, that is that is agnostic to the clouds in the landscape, it's really difficult to drive those connections and it's even more difficult to drive that transparency and resiliency and security. It's interesting, we got a, we were mentioning on the opening, a perfect storm. Uh, in your career, have you seen anything like this before? Dave and I were speculating the hype cycle and adoption curve and spending is almost like on top of each other. You're seeing the convergence of old, new, some have a tailwind, some have a headwind. It's interesting time. What's your as, as a career tech per, uh, leader, explain this moment in time. Um, the patterns are super similar, I think. Yeah. Um, we saw this with mainframe to client server to first internet generation, multiple OSs, that, that you've, the architectural shifts that we've seen from the 60s to 70s, I think follow, are following that same pattern. But I think the crazy part that you guys do such a good job of trying to capture is the compression of time. It's happening so quickly and it's happening across all layers of the stack so quickly. And I think because things like LLMs tie together all these different, usually separate categories and separate motions because they're using the same basic GPT framework and the same language thinking to um, really blend how these categories would be isolated and move more slowly. That acceleration okay. is, is where I think most of us are sitting back. It's like, where, like, how quick, what's going to happen next? Like, yeah. Um, in fact, Jeff Jonas was on the uh, discussion with Dave on breaking analysis. He's former IBMer doing sensing, a big uh, start, a data startup. He was joking about the AI hype, saying companies are getting term sheets from VC, startups getting a term sheet from a VC before they get their money. Their models obsolete. And, and, I and so, if really joking. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I know. I mean, you're, I bet he's yeah. well, you're seeing open, you're seeing open source. I mean, the, the 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 scale 
You know what else too? Yeah. You're talking about the layers, and you go back to the 80s and 90s, that's when you know, the mainframe blew apart and the, the industry competition started to occur along layers, whether it was Intel and semiconductors, Seagate and disk drives or whatever, yep. database, Oracle. Yeah, that old ISO seven layer model. It, it, that, right. It still it, exists it, to, a, to yeah. a degree. But there was some thinking that cloud would change that, that things would become more consolidated, but <laughs> it seems like LLMs and AI are going to increase the granularity of the stack. Do you buy that? Oh, 100%. Even cloud solving that, like we've been told that in every generation. Yeah. Clouds make it significantly more complex. Like the, the, the beauty of Amazon and, and Microsoft and Google is just three of the cloud vendors, is they are so efficient that they've now generated hundreds of unique services. Every service has their own API calls. They've got their own uh, abstraction layers they're trying to, to manage those and they're all different yeah. across every cloud. So what I've seen with every generation is it gets more complex because we're getting more refined. You know, why does DB Engines track 27 different database categories today? When I started, there was hier hierarchical network and relational, yeah. and that was it. it was <laughs> and relational was the new, the new <laughs> thing that was going <laughs> to solve the world. And now we've got ledger and vector and graph and everything you think of because when you get to billions of people, you need yeah. specific uh, capability and, and focus, and then you need to tie all the, these things together. So as yeah. we expand our technology, we're going to nicheify for sure. And <laughs> LLMs is what I think what blows, what's so hard for us to digest mentally yeah. is there's so many unaddressed categories that need to be addressed. I was talking to someone that's a property manager the other day. What I love about Austin is I've got so many friends in different verticals and just tech. He goes, you know, there's no package. If you uh, property manage like 10 properties or four packets, or if you're an HOA that's trying to manage them, there's no, no solution there. There's, for some reason, we've got a cutoff line of around 40 homes or individual you know, one home management. It's like, well, I'm sure there'll be one in Six months because with an LLM you can now create a HOA or property management package. So I just I think the diversity of what we're going to yeah. see is going to go through the roof. But we need it to because we don't have our needs met. Yeah. In you mentioned o you mentioned the OSI model, and we talk about a lot about open source and how that's fueling this perfect storm. Um, and the OSI model was the open systems interconnect that created that seven layers. TCP IP was a key aspect of that. Absolutely. And that, that broke down, remember when we were breaking in the yep. business, IBM had SNA, network operating system. Yep. DEC had DECnet. DECnet. It blew it and all these away. were proprietary yeah. NASAs, or network operating systems. Yep. And that was the, their proprietary vendor. We kind of sometimes say, you got the cloud, AWS has its own stack, Azure has its own stack. So is the super cloud OSI model coming yeah. <laughs> where open has to happen? It, I think it has to happen. That's as a, and again, it depends where a corporation is today. At West Blunk, we were majority in AWS on purpose. Like we need a reference operating system, which the clouds are to, to develop our stuff against. If we're going to move everything to the cloud and break it apart and, and we just can't do it simultaneously across three. And I see so many companies there. So within that world, maybe you can just use the native cloud services, uh, n native networking cloud services that these folks have. But there's still a pretty big <laughs> gap yeah. that from on what they're providing as far as uh, transparency and remediation. And so I, you know, we're trying to add value there as, as Aviatrix, but these, it's so different yeah. across these different clouds. Yeah. But as a company, yeah. I, I can't, it, for me to spend all of my energy on parsing and identifying how to be a super cloud provider or how to take advantage of a super cloud, really, I, they need to spend time on features and functions and what to do with LLMs to serve <laughs> yeah. their customers better. And, and I don't think that that networking layer is where most of them will get most of their value as a you know, large IT shopper. And SuperCloud too, we had Walmart on. Yeah, they can afford to do it. We yeah. had Uber on a breaking analysis. They can afford to do it, yeah. but most companies can't. Yeah, and I think IT yeah. is going to have to move to the, this cloud secure model with AI. And I think you know, we call it the super stack. Yeah, you get super computing, the physical layer, I mean, the OSI model kind of references today, but not perfectly. You got physical layer. Yep. You got some sort of interoperability layer, middleware, and then you got the application. So you got super computing, yep. super cloud, and super apps. Absolutely. That's going to be, we see that. And, and uh, how do you prepare? How does the company prepare today? I mean, Main Street IT that doesn't have the Uber staff. Is it managed services? How do companies compete knowing that the attackers are coming. Absolutely. AI is coming. You got a surge of AI, new capabilities. You got attackers. How does a, how does a normal company compete? It, it would be very, very difficult. And I, I think you wind up turning to trusted vendors oh, yeah. to do lower layers in your delivery so that you can focus on the upper layers to serve your customers and help your employee base be effective and manage your partners and the stuff that really matters to drive the PL.
Um, awesome. So. Well, Doug, thanks for coming on and, and keynoting our SuperCloud 3. Great, Great to, to see you. you. I'm honored. Back in the game, back in the arena, as they say, <laughs> <laughs> with Aviatrix. Put a quick plug in for Aviatrix, we've got 30 seconds. Uh, for, for all of you out there that are seriously trying to develop mission critical workloads in any cloud and are beginning to think about how do I not be held hostage with one cloud, and they're, they're awesome vendors, but, but you need to be diversified, look up Aviatrix, where we will help you on the network optimization side and the different corollaries around that. Awesome. Doug Murray here at SuperCloud. I'm Jeffrey Dave Vellante. Stay with more coverage. We've got a great agenda today. We'll be right back with our next guest.